Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the session one oral cancer of the webinar series in head and neck oncosurgery. This webinar is hosted by the University of Chicago Center in Delhi in collaboration with University College of Medical Sciences and the University of Chicago Medicine. Without wasting any time, I would like to invite Dr. Nishant Agrawal from U Chicago Medicine to provide opening remarks. Thank you, Suman. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome. My name is Nishant Agrawal and I'm Professor of Surgery and Section Chief of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Chicago. This evening, we are hosting our inaugural webinar, which is part of a series of lectures on head and neck oncology in collaboration with Dr. Ripon Arora, Professor in the Department of ENT and Head and Neck Surgery at the University College of Medical Sciences, University of Delhi, and the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. A lot of you have been here, and unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we have to switch to a webinar this year. Before we dive into our program, I want to briefly introduce the University of Chicago and our center in Delhi. University of Chicago is one of the world's premier academic and research institutions and has driven new ways of thinking since its found, founding in 1890. Today, UChicago is an intellectual destination that draws inspired scholars to its Hyde Park campus and international centers, keeping UChicago at the nexus of ideas that challenge and change the world. In establishing a center in India in 2014, the University of Chicago draws upon a long and rich history of excellence in scholarship, research, and teaching related to South Asia. Since 2014, the center in Delhi has hosted 590 events with more than 140 collaborators and 30,000 participants and awarded nearly 100 grants. Today, the center in Delhi is instrumental in hosting faculty activities, and its presence has allowed University of Chicago faculty to establish long-term relationships with partners in the region, resulting in a constant stream of contact and collaboration. It has also allowed the university to build lasting institutional partnerships with Indian institutions, including those represented by many of you here today. Through the center, the University of Chicago's growing collaborations in India around health and medicine have ranged from work with the Indian government on expanding healthcare to developing a non-invasive diagnostic tool for early detection of oral cancer. Their center illustrates our commitment to growing knowledge and enriching human life. So thank you everyone and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Now I would like to invite Professor A.K. Jain from University College of Medical Sciences to provide uh, welcome remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, dear Nishant Agarwal from U Chicago and Chicago University, uh, distinguished faculty and uh, dear participants. I'm so very happy to participate uh, in the first of the seminar. Uh, um, webinar series on oral cancer. Well, as you know that for oral cancer, we, India and Indian subcontinent are in a difficult, uh, different frame than the world uh, because we have a huge number of oral cancers, uh, so much so that uh, our incidence is, our, uh, is, is almost, it is one of the uh, top three uh, oral cancer uh, of the total cancer in India. And uh, the reason being that because of some social habits of tobacco chewing or betel nut chewing, and uh, that is spread far and wide. We have a huge population. So as such, the number of these patients, they are huge in number. We have a huge disease burden. And uh, these patients, since uh, they, they come at a very younger age, and they have some of, uh, uh, since they are in far off places as well, where the, uh, our healthcare is not, uh, we, we do not have an optimal delivery of healthcare universally in, in the length and breadth of the country. So there is always a delay in the diagnosis. The reach to us, to the tertiary care center or to the treatment centers in a far advanced stage of disease. Hence, they have a big complex problem to tackle. Uh, to treat. And in that, treating such a huge disease burden, 
as such because of share population younger patients patients having a, uh, a pre malignant uh, submucosal mucosal fibrosis patients uh, reaching an advanced stage of the disease it's a it's a huge challenge and in that light if we take uh, this kind of a webinar series then we find that we uh, we have a big task at our hand and we have to educate our young ent surgeons or all those people who uh, deal with uh, head and neck and oral cancers uh, to the guidelines agreed uh, globally and as well as an opportunity to to innovate because we have to treat them in the available infrastructure at far and wide places as well so this is an unique uh, opportunity where uh, each one of us each delegate uh, uh, will learn and will be exposed to the guidelines uh, accepted globally and i'm told there are about 1000 uh, registration from 52 countries so that shows the enthusiasm of the participants and i'm sure this symposium this webinar series will go in a long way to take care of uh, oral cancers so i extend my uh, uh, best of luck to the participant for an academic feast and uh, uh, i'm sure they will come out uh, at the end of the series wiser thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity to speak thanks very much thank you professor jain i now request dr moni ibrahim kuriakos from cochin cancer research institute to moderate the session speech over to you dr moni thank you good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are let me also extend a warm welcome to this uh, oral cancer symposium so what's the plan for today is to have uh, two lectures given by authorities in the field followed by a panel discussion dealing with advanced uh, oral cavity cancer so without uh, wasting much time i would like to invite the first speaker dr zen gui he's going to talk about uh, a neck dissection state of art uh, i want uh, all the audience to participate in the discussion by putting the question answer in that uh, q a uh, booth thank you and uh, welcoming uh, dr gui Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, well, sorry. Good evening. Uh, I realize that there is a time difference uh, for uh, the vast majority of you. Um, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can uh, see my slide? Okay. Um, it gives me great honor and privilege uh, to be speaking to your group. Um, we had the opportunity for close collaboration last year, and unfortunately, due to what's going on, um, uh, we'll have to do this instead. uh but it is always an honor and privilege uh to be in the presence of esteemed uh, faculty uh members among the uh, panelists uh so i actually renamed uh my presentation to uh, reflect uh what i thought was the state of the current art of understanding of the uh, neck uh dissection uh which is a critical component of what we deal with in terms of treating oral cavity cancers so uh before uh, we uh, launch into a uh, contemporary data um i thought that it would be particularly relevant to share uh some insights from dr crile uh and this was from his original paper published in 1906 uh with the american medical association uh so you know reading this uh paper yesterday i thought that it had some particular pertinent insights that are still very applicable today uh so what dr crile mentioned was that uh in oral cavity cancer immediate extension of the primary focus is principally by lymphatic permeation and metastasis in the regional lymphatic glands and then he goes on to say that in cancer of the head and neck death almost always occurs by local and regional development of the disease so you know for all the uh, current understanding of um you know head and neck cancer this was actually known uh, in 1906 and so then dr crow goes on to say what then is the best method of surgical attack an incomplete operation disseminates and stimulates the growth shortens life and diminishes comfort local excision of the primary focus only is as unsurgical as excision of a breast leaving the regional glands 
And then finally, he says, judged by analogy and experience, the logical technique is then of a block dissection of the regional lymphatic system. And such a dissection, uh, and this is of particular relevance, is indicated whether or not the glands are or are not palpable. Uh, so this was in before even the advent of cross-sectional imaging. Uh, and, you know, um, Dr. Crowell knew this in 1906. So going on to more contemporary data, uh, this was a study of uh, 216 patients with early stage oral tongue squamous cell carcinoma. And one can see that the pathologic status of the neck has a significant impact on survival. A multivariate analysis in the same study identified occult nodal metastasis as the main independent predictor of overall survival, disease specific survival and recurrence free survival. Uh, patients with occult nodal metastasis had a five-fold increased risk of dying of disease compared to those that did not. Many of you are familiar uh, with this most randomized, uh, recent randomized clinical trial data from Tata Memorial. Uh, this group very elegantly demonstrated a significant difference in overall and disease-free survival in patients who received elective neck dissection over observation and salvage surgery for neck recurrence after treatment of the primary site. Uh, with a median follow-up of 39 months, uh, elective neck dissection resulted in improved survival of over 12% compared to therapeutic neck dissection performed at the detection of cancer recurrence. Patients in the elective surgery group also had a higher rate of disease-free survival of over 20%. So this was a post hoc uh, analysis uh, determining uh, factors which could affect uh, survival. And the group did not demonstrate uh, any uh, particular uh, features uh, that would, uh, for which patients would stand to benefit from elective neck dissection based on uh, clinical or pathologic factors. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to uh, that uh, was that the data from this study suggested that among the patients with a tumor depth of invasion uh, measuring less than three millimeters, uh, there was suggestion for the lack of benefit of an elective neck dissection. Although once again, the authors highlight the trial was not specifically designed to assess this variable. Uh, now, the, the other thing was that depth of invasion of the primary tumor was the only factor that was significantly associated with node positivity. Uh, there was a marked increase in cumulative lymph node positivity uh, which was observed with increasing depth of invasion from three millimeters at 5.6% uh, to four millimeters, at which point uh, close to 17% of patients uh, had a called nodal metastasis. So this is an amalgamation of uh, more recent and past um, uh, clinical data related to the use of elective neck dissection uh, versus observation. Uh, in this meta-analysis of randomized controlled and matched prospective studies uh, comparing either neck dissection or observation for T1 to T2 oral cavity cancers, as you can see here, uh, that there was a significantly lower rate of recurrence in the elective neck dissection group at 15% uh, percent compared to 51% in the observation group. Uh, the, this study also demonstrated that elective neck dissection was also associated with higher overall survival and disease-free survival rates when compared with observation. The significance of depth of invasion is acknowledged in the AJCC8 uh, staging system, uh, for which depth of invasion is formally incorporated into the T staging criteria. Uh, with every incremental increase of five millimeters of depth of invasion resulting in an upstaging and T stage. Now we acknowledge that there is a, exists a wide range of uh, published studies uh, describing an optimal cutoff point for depth of invasion uh, for which there is an over 20% risk of nodal metastasis and what our, um, many experts uh, regard as the threshold for performing an elective neck dissection. Uh, shown here is a table from a retrospective study of 286 patients uh, who underwent primary cancer resection and neck dissection. Now in this study, no patients with a depth of one millimeter of invasion or less had a positive node. Uh, from 1.1 to two millimeters of depth of invasion, 9% of patients had a positive node. 
Uh, so the data here validates the conventionally accepted criteria of four millimeters for which the risk of nodal metastasis is in excess of 20%. But we still acknowledge that there is a wide uh, heterogeneity and we tend to treat oral cavity cancers as a, a single group when uh, data also indicates that there is variance uh, for the threshold for depth of invasion and the risk of occult nodal metastasis depending on subsite. Now, uh, switching our gears a bit, um, what constitutes an uh, adequate uh, neck dissection? Uh, and this is a focus on the quality metric uh, that is increasingly becoming the focus for all surgical disciplines. Uh, this was a recent publication involving an analysis of patients enrolled on the ROTOG 9501 and 0234 trials, uh, which involved uh, patients receiving post-op radiation and chemo radiation. Uh, but this data was based on pathologic uh, staging of lymph nodes. Um, uh, and this uh, was a study that involved over 500 patients with a median follow-up of eight years. What the authors demonstrated uh, is what you see over here, uh, which constitutes what we call an adequate uh, neck dissection. Uh, the figure uh, shows overall survival curves uh, for patients receiving less than 18 nodes uh, on dissection, uh, comparing those who had greater than 18 nodes uh, from their neck dissection. Um, uh, there was a higher risk of death uh, and local regional failure for patients who had uh, a dissection uh, with less than 18 nodes uh, for their neck operation. Now, uh, switching tack a bit, uh, there is a recent uh, focus as well uh, towards uh, reducing the um, uh, extent of neck dissections. Uh, so uh, from on-block uh, resection to modified radical, radical neck dissection, and now to uh, super selective neck dissections. Uh, so the question is, in a clinically and uh, no negative neck, uh, whether super high neck dissection uh, compromises uh, survival uh, outcomes, uh, this uh, meta-analysis was not uh, designed uh, to address that question, uh, but uh, this shows the very low rate of uh, level four involvement in all existing uh, published studies. Uh, the rate of level four skip metastasis did not increase significantly as well uh, in, with any nodal involvement in levels one to three. And it was also not involved by tumor staging or location of the primary site uh, cancer. Now, if you were to think about a more even super, super selective uh, operation uh, for the management of oral cavity cancers, uh, this involves uh, the use of sentinel lymph node biopsies. Uh, and what you see here is an, ML, uh, is an example of a number of multi-center uh, clinical trials uh, that demonstrated a very high sensitivity uh, for the detection of occult uh, nodal metastasis. Um, uh, so most of these studies uh, were done in Europe. Um, uh, the acknowledgement is that, um, that uh, sentinel lymph nodes may not always be as sensitive for the detection of uh, called nodal metastasis from floor of mouth cancers as opposed to uh, tongue cancers. Uh, following on from this, this is a randomized uh, trial uh, that is currently accruing, uh, comparing, uh, which is the first uh, known trial comparing sentinel lymph node biopsy versus elective neck dissection, which uh, opened for accrual in July 2020. Uh, central to this um, uh, clinical trial is the role for PET CT in ruling out a called nodal metastasis uh, prior to um, enrollment of patients. Uh, so patients can only be randomized if they had a negative uh, PET-CT prior to any intervention. The primary outcome of interest in the study in the phase two component is actually quality of life uh, measured by patient reported shoulder dysfunction. Um, and only in the phase three of trial, uh, this trial uh, will we know about the results for disease-free survival. One thing that we don't uh, often uh, think about is the pathologic status uh, that is conferred by a uh, neck dissection. Uh, 
And so um, what we see here uh, is uh, high level uh, clinical evidence, although dated from some time ago, um, RTOG9501 uh, uh, not only defined high risk surgical patients uh, as those with positive, positive surgical margins or extra nodal extension, but also key to this is patients with greater than two regional nodes uh, for which adjuvant chemo radiation uh, was shown to confer survival benefit over adjuvant radiation alone. Uh, and in the EORTC22931 trial, um, what was also considered as an adverse histopathologic feature for which adjuvant chemo radiation was warranted was level four or five node, nodes involvement in oral cavity cancers. So to conclude, um, neck dissection remains an essential tool uh, to guide the need for and extent of adjuvant treatment. Um, and with the trend towards a more selective neck dissection, we need to identify uh, the patient population that truly stands to benefit uh, in terms of subsite as well as uh, depth of invasion. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to uh, share uh, some of our insights with you. Um, and uh, thanks for uh, hopeful uh, for the opportunity for further collaboration in the future. Thank you, Dr. Gui. Uh, I would like to invite the next speaker, uh, Dr. Pankaj Chaturvedi, to, to cover the topic about uh, 10 points to improve the results in oral cancer. Uh, we will take the question from Dr. Gui's uh, talk uh, towards the end of the panel discussion. Pankaj, over to you. So thank you, uh, Nishant. And uh, thank you, Vipin, for inviting me. And it is indeed a pleasure. And in this topic, uh, in the world of pessimism, we are all living in COVID. Let us discuss uh, some positive things. And recently in Nature, there was a publication of the SEER data that of all the head and neck cancers, oral cancer incidence is declining and the uh, outcomes are improving. So that uh, paper, when I looked at, I thought that uh, what could be the things that we can uh, attribute which have led to the improvement in uh, outcome of the oral cancer. And also having spent 25 years in management of oral cancer, I have seen this entire journey myself that how we were treating oral cancer uh, two decades back and what we are doing now. Certainly there is an improvement. So certainly uh, from where we started and where we are, imaging is able to help us accurately delineate, do proper surgical planning, plan for organ preservation. And most importantly, I remember when we used to go by the millimeter or centimeter of margin, now we have come to deciding on the margin, especially on the bony margin or oral cancer based on the radiological finding. Similarly, many of us never believed in doing the CT scan for locally advanced because we felt that distant metastasis doesn't happen in them. But as we mature and we uh, do more and more imaging, we find that some of those patients whom we operated actually we shouldn't have done it. And certainly in the era when we are uh, going to give more and more organ preservation, then the response assessment is best uh, seen by uh, imaging. Uh, this was a very interesting paper written by one of our colleagues at Tata Hospital. It shows that how radiological findings, they impact the decision making in uh, oral cancer and what is its implication. Now we know by several publications that uh, infratemporal fossa, if it is a low infratemporal fossa because we see a lot of retromolar trigone cancers, and in those retromolar trigone cancers, involvement of ITF happens very early. And that is why, though technically in TNM, ITF invasion may be called stage 4B, but many of these are surgically amenable and they are curable by surgical intervention. But high ITF, contentious area, but surge, certainly this is something that some of the surgeons would like to do. But this distinction between the low and high ITF is something that has come by our expert radiologist. And within high ITF also, if there is just loss of retroenteral fat, 
still we may consider for uh, doing surgery. But if something is going right up to the skull base, we'll think twice before doing the surgery. Similarly, very nicely told by Zen that depth of invasion has, been, uh, has become a part of the staging. And those patients who are going on non-surgical treatment, though it is a rarity, still by uh, doing the imaging, we are able to get the depth of invasion and uh, stage them before the treatment. And of course, if we are talking about the tongue cancer going into the valicular base of tongue, I remember sometimes we used to do the examination under anesthesia to find those, but now we are able to know it better by uh, imaging modalities. This study by Hisham again helps us do, helps us avoid unwarranted treatment in those patients where uh, if the PET scan is negative, you can avoid neck dissection. And certainly uh, this helps uh, not only uh, emotionally for the patient, but financially for the nation. The second point is that surgical technology has certainly improved. And to this surgical crowd, uh, I need not uh, spend much time. But certainly we are in an uh, era where the turnaround time for the prefabricated surgical guides has dramatically reduced and it has immensely helped us in planning. And uh, in the Far East, in the Japan and in the Korea, our colleagues are using uh, intraoperative adjuncts for uh, assessment of the margins and uh, good results have been shown by them. Sentinel node already covered by Jin. It is not widely uh, practiced all over the world, but certainly it has a promise for the future as the technology uh, advances. And certainly for a class of patients, it is being uh, routinely offered in many parts of uh, Europe and in the uh, US. One thing that has really, I have seen in my own uh, 25 years is the change in the way we are doing the reconstruction. And on the right side, you see how in 1959, we started with revascularized flat. And then in 1979, Aryan pectoralis major myocutaneous flap. And down below, you can see the full facial transplant, uh, which happened in uh, 2010 in Spain. So we moved from pedicle flap to the bony reconstruction to allo transplant to prefabricated reconstruction. Now we have tissue engineered bone. And of course, there are navigational reconstruction which are possible. Now, whether reconstruction and spending so much of time and energy really helps or not, this study very elegant uh, shows that how if we compare on the University of Washington quality of life in oral cancer patients treated with or without uh, uh, microvascular reconstruction, if we see that in all the major domains, there is a significant improvement that the patient who undergo microvascular flap enjoy. And this was a systemic, systematic review of uh, many uh, studies and that also shows that uh, patients who have uh, microvascular reconstruction compared to the pedicle flap they enjoy better quality of life and outcome now all the credit of improvement in survival and outcome cannot be taken purely by the surgeons our uh, radiation oncologists have done uh, amazingly good job in fact some of the greatest advances have happened in radiotherapy and chemotherapy rather than in surgery alone. And in radiotherapy, they have gone to an extent of uh, genomic adjusted radiation dosing. Now, these were the things that we would have never imagined, but now 4D treatment planning, adaptive radiotherapy, dose painting, proton ion, we have so many things in our armamentarium. And certainly radiotherapy has gone safer and safer. And now we see patients after three weeks or four weeks of well-planned radiotherapy, and we hardly see a skin reaction or mucosal reaction. So the credit goes to our friends in radiotherapy. Chemotherapy, certainly we know by uh, several meta-analysis that how addition of chemotherapy led to improvement in survival by 6%. And uh, cetuximab, actually, it sounds like a history now. Because I remember 10, 15 years back when the Bonner's publication came, there was so much of excitement. But within last decade, we are, there are so many targets that have been found and how many 
drugs have come it's difficult for some time sometimes to pronounce even and even if you look at the pembrolizumab nivolumab in two years look at the number of molecules that are there in pipeline and they are going to become history so certainly there is a uh, uh, great advances uh, made in chemotherapy and this advance in chemotherapy very nicely also covered by zen that it has improved our ability to choose carefully whom to give chemotherapy along with radiotherapy with an aim to improve the outcome and in these two publications which came back to back the cut margin positive and extra capsular spread came out very strongly but i'm sure there are studies going on and in those soft indication perinular invasion vascular embolism multiple nodes extensive depth of invasion perhaps those can also be good indication for adding chemotherapy to radiotherapy uh, nutrition I, I have seen that how uh, we started with the home based uh, food and how uh, only the coconut water and the rice water and milk those things were given around 20 25 years back and now we have come to extent where patients despite enteral nutrition for 20 days 30 days they do not lose weight and they do not have cachexia so this uh, progress uh, not only in terms of the nutrition but the way we give the nutrition all things have dramatically improved in last and it continues to improve and we know that how perioperative nutrition also improves the outcome one thing that has again uh, been part of most cancer centers and wherever to the audience i would say if you do not have such facility please add the facility for rehabilitation traditionally surgeons were supposed to do all this they were supposed to guide the resident doctors were supposed to guide the uh, patients about the jaw stretching exercise or swallowing exercise we know how busy we are or how sometimes incompetent we are unless we have a dedicated rehabilitation facility the social reinsertion and uh, uh, the back to uh, jo job may not happen for these patients and that is why having a dedicated rehabilitation service has made a sea change in outcome of these patients last two three slides we know that in india all only five to uh, nine percent of the patients are stage one and stage two and in us almost uh, 30 percent patients are stage one and stage two and this is one area where we cannot make huge advances in treating oral cancer patient but at least we can do the stage migration and if we can do the stage migration and get more and more patient in the domain of uh, first uh, stage or second stage perhaps we can make a change in the outcome by stage migration itself and that is where uh, the government of india's whole program national oral health program and many of the doctors themselves are indulging in uh, these programs and there is a nationwide oral cancer screening program which is quite effective and uh, i i'm sure that at least because of these uh, wide policy approaches we will have significant reduction in stage four cancer and certainly outcomes will be better india has done reasonably well in uh, uh, controlling the etiology and it is one of those countries uh, which in six years showed a dramatic reduction in tobacco consumption uh, which is one of the singular cause of high burden of uh, oral cancer in india and this may reflect 15 to 20 years from now with the reduced incidence of uh, oral cancer and before the conference i was speaking to uh, uh, vipin that i remember those con uh, uh, conference uh, physical conferences where banquets were essential and drinks were essential for all the banquets which is a known etiology thanks to the virtual conferences now those etiologies are controlled and the money for the organizers is saved and the last i would say that what has really helped is specialization i remember there was a time when anybody could treat oral cancer but now patient's choice institutional preferences and also the surgeons are training themselves well and most patients wherever they are treated by the multi disciplinary tumor boards the outcomes are better so certainly these things have led to a better outcome and uh, 
again i would say that oral cancer in the last slide is an indian disease no one else is going to help us in this matter and if we all can put our brains together we can certainly find a very sustainable and easy solution for this complex problem thank you so much thank you pankaj i really appreciate uh, your uh, uh, amazing summary of uh, the tips to improve the outcome there was one question uh, from i don't know where that person is from the question is whether we can do implant after marginal mandibulectomy any thoughts so uh, implant after marginal band uh, mandibulectomy can certainly be done whether it is a primary implant or secondary implant is more important so what i would suggest that it all depends upon how much residual uh, cortex is remaining and whether your uh, doctor uh, your uh, implantologist or your dentist is comfortable putting that number one that is intraoperative but in my preference i would not do uh, intraoperative or primary implant i would do the reconstruction whether the soft tissue reconstruction most likely with the marginal mandibulectomy and once the patient has completed the radiotherapy then i would go for secondary implant uh, thank you pankaj i think we will move on and now we're going to have the exciting uh, part of the conference uh, that is about the panel discussion uh, to lead the panel i would like to request uh, dr garg to moderate the uh, and lead the panel discussion please dr garg over to you thank you so much dr moni and uh, without wasting time since we are already running short of time i would state be going to our panel we have a ex ex excellent panel we will be having dr nishant from university of chicago and dr d cruz and i would like to congratulate him for becoming the first indian to be the president of uicc dr salim would be joining us from haifa dr rathor would be joining us from delhi monadar medical college dr shamit will be joining us from patel hospital jalandhar Dr. Anand Gupta would be joining us from GMC at Chandigarh. Dr. Pragya Shukla would be joining us from Delhi State Cancer Institute, and Dr. Deepak Bala Subramaniam from Amrita Institute, Kochi. So I would request Dr. Pallavi to go through the first case, please. Ankit, do you mind? Deepak had some comments, I think, on some questions, and he want he wanted to say something. Deepak, you wanted to yeah, say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Nishant, can I definitely Dr. Deepak speak about this? It's about two of the points that uh, Pankaj sir had uh, highlighted. Um, you have to realize that there is a lot of bias when a trial is being conducted. Uh, you have the best selected patients, so you have the most stringent inclusive uh, inclusion criteria, the most uh, stringent exclusion criteria. For example, the Bernier and Cooper combined analysis, uh, which had uh, stated that if you have ecs and positive margins you give adjuvant chemotherapy with radiation but if you look at the ncdb analysis which is a population based analysis ajmani published it a couple of years ago and they found out that if you have positive margins you don't have to give chemotherapy so my point here is that any clinical trial has to be validated in a community setting where the patients are not specifically selected and uh, i don't think it's right to absorb a clinical trial into clinical practice without it being uh, proved in a in a community setting because you know a, a trial setting is completely different from uh, what you would do to patients and the second point that he mentioned was cancer cachexia the problem with cancer cachexia is that even if you treat the cancer cachexia very well i mean cancer cachexia is a huge topic to discuss by itself you have impaired anabolism impaired cori cycle you have the warburg effect you have so many problems in a patient with cancer cachexia and if someone has cancer cachexia they're going to do badly and none of the interventions to date both with micronutrients and macronutrients have shown to improve survival so that is an area that because it's all acute phase reactive proteins which you know uh, cause the cancer to spill over the normal physiology so i think clinical trials have to be validated in a community setting with a large population either by a population series analysis or a large single institution analysis and i think that if you have cancer cachexia 
it's a problem that so far we have not found the answer because I have treated patients with cancer cachexia with micronutrients, you know, your lipoic acids, essential fatty acids, giving them essential proteins. But the problem is, it is a problem with multiple metabolic pathways. And if you're in cancer cachexia, your outcome is really bad. So I think that is something that has to start pre-treatment. Uh, you know, mid-arm circumference, weight loss by history, uh, biochemical markers with your albumin, your CRP and all of that. But just here. So I completely agree with you. There is no doubt yeah. about it. I think you took the word cachexia very literally. Actually, we are talking about the perioperative nutrition. And this perioperative Correct. nutrition, actually cachexia, don't take it <laughs> very literally. No, no I, I agree, sir. Yeah. I'm just trying to educate yeah, the right. audience that uh, cachexia is a much deeper Correct. problem to Absolutely. think of. So cachexia uh, is not the correct word. Uh, I agree with you because what happens when there is a prolonged uh, recovery for these patients after flap failure, so they go into catabolic phase. So maybe yes. catabolic phase yeah. is a better yeah. word. So yeah, I think that, that's the better word, sir. Yeah, I agree, sir. <laughs> because I, they don't realize this, sir. They don't realize that this is a problem. You operate for 18 hours and the patient's in a catabolic phase. Yeah. You're going to end up with problems with the flap, problems with healing and problems with your outcome. Yeah. And so, second yeah. about validation of the any randomized control trial in community. Yes, I agree with you. However, what happens that these days, this is all consumer driven societies. If someone demands based on an NEGM paper or Lancet paper, we have to comply to that because uh, validation, particularly in India, doesn't come so fast. And yes. by the time you complete validation, new research will come, new data will emerge, and we will become obsolete. So point well taken. Thank you so much, Deepak. Thank you, sir. Dr. Deepak and Dr. Chaturvedi, thank you so much, Dr. Deepak. And we are, that is why we are having many publications on real-world scenarios. But I think let us go to the first case, and I will have this opportunity to, to ask in questions from the experts. And I do not want to, you know, short my time. Okay, Pallavi, can you please start that? So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. I'll start with the first case. Is my screen visible? So this is a 47-year-old gentleman who presented to us with a non-healing ulcer over left buccal mucosa of six months duration. He had inability to open mouth completely for last one month. The patient did not have any systemic comorbidities. His addiction, addiction history revealed uh, that he was a good, chronic Gutka chewer and a chronic smoker who had reformed recently with a smoking index of 20 pack years. We did a biopsy which showed evidence of moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So these are the clinical pictures of the patient. So the patient had an ECOG performance status of one. He had a grade four trismus. He had an ulceroproliferative proliferative growth over the left buccal mucosa with following extensions. We assessed the extension using a zero degree endoscope. So anteriorly, the disease was extending up to the oral commissure. Posteriorly, it was not appreciable because of the uh, limited mouth opening. Superior and inferior GBS were involved. And there was a skin puckering with the induration reaching above the level of zygoma. On clinical palpation of neck, we noticed that there was an ipsilateral cervical lymph adenopathy at stations 1B, 3, and 4. So coming to the CT scan, we, uh, the patient underwent a contrast-enhanced CT scan, and this is the coronal, uh, this is the axial cuts of the CT scan running in the background. So the patient had a mass in the left buccal mucosa, which was infiltrating the left masseter muscle, medial pterygoid, and lower part of the temporalis muscle. Anterior and posterior lateral walls of the maxilla were also eroded, as is visible. It was reaching up to the subcutaneous fat, and there was nodal, uh, a nodal tissue palpable at level 3 and 4. Bilateral subcentimetric lymph nodes were also observed. So again, running the uh, coronal cuts for the same patients to collaborate the findings with the axial cuts. So we can see that there is a massive disease which has eroded the anti, uh, which has eroded the lateral wall of the maxilla as well. So this is a still image showing the disease burden. 
So the patient was clinically staged as T4B N2B uh, M0 carcinoma oral cavity, subsite being the left buccal alveolar complex. Over to Dr. Pankaj for further discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Pallavi. So I would uh, be asking my first question to Dr. D. Cruz based on his vast experience. Now, uh, Dr. D. Cruz, would you like to share any trick of the trade to evaluate these patients who have got a great fortressness? Anyway, before I start, Pankaj, thanks for your kind introduction and congratulations. But there's a small correction. I'm the first elected president of the UICC from India. If you look at the chronicles of the UICC, and I just happened to see it two days back, uh, Dr. Kanolkar, who was a doyen and uh, one of our leaders at the Research Institute in Tatars, was uh, president of the UICC between 58 and 62. But those days, there was no election. It was just a small executive committee. There were no member organizations. But theoretically, he was president 58 to 62. So I'm the first elected president. So a small correction. So great. Uh, I think Pankaj did show for that imaging. That was his first slide is one of the, uh, one of the uh, pearls that would increase uh, outcomes or better outcomes in oral cancer. For me, it would be a combination of both. It would be a combination of imaging plus clinical evaluation. So certain things like the soft tissue extent of disease, mucosal extent, which may not be seen on the, on the CT or MR, like a disease creeping back into the tonsil region, creeping up into the soft palate, which is you know not really appreciable. So I, I think it should be a combination of uh, clinical, as well as appropriate imaging. And when I say appropriate imaging, it could be either a CT or an MR. Sometimes we do supplement uh, uh, oral cancer with both. That means a few cuts of the other, a PET scan to rule out uh, uh, distant metastasis when appropriate. So that you have my, my, my second question, which was actually, do you always ask for PET CT in a distant, for, you know, to look for distant metastasis in your practice? Or a CCT thorax is sufficient to exclude because extra pulmonary metastasis is rare. Dr. So Dr. I, Salim, I think, I think Dr. They, Dr. Salim, would you like to answer this question? Dr. Salim? Yes, hello, everybody. Yeah, hello. Hello. So, so uh, I think that the CT scan will be, uh, will be enough. Uh, for for this patient, and we use here a CT scan, sometimes with bone scan. Uh, we have also PET, PET FDG available, but I think that the, the CT scan with good radiologist can be enough so to... Uh, your, so, Dr. Salim, in your practice, you routinely do not get a PET CT done in an advanced oral cancer, and you believe that the CT chest is good enough? Yes. Look for extra pulmonary metastasis. But Nishant, what is your practice? I know you you do not see these tumors so commonly. Yeah. Bunkett, so generally for advanced stage head and neck cancers, including advanced stage oral cavity cancers, we generally go to a PET scan. Um, I think in particular for this patient with lower level neck disease, level three and four, there's a higher incidence of uh, distant metastasis. I think we would definitely want to thoroughly evaluate the distant sites. So you, so uh, if I if I get you correctly, you you always get a PET CT in these patients. Stage so three and four, we generally, generally get um, uh, PET PET CTs. Yes. So uh, difference of opinion. So I'll come to Dr. Shamit. Uh, what is your practice, Dr. Shamit? So in 2014, we had uh, we had tried to study our patterns of metastasis in uh, distant metastasis in head neck cancer. We looked at a cohort of 773 patients, and uh, we realized that uh, for stage three and stage four. We realized that a CCT, at that time we were not a pet institution. We acquired the pet only the next year after that study was done. Uh, but uh, a CCT thorax is adequate uh, systemic staging in our opinion. Uh, we usually, in our, in our area of practice, we see a lot of alcohol related cancers also. So we supplement it with an ultrasound abdomen because a CCT chest and the lower cuts of that don't really help too much. A pet, I would only reserve in advanced oral cancer if you have really low uh, level 4 and level 5 metastasis where you think an intraclavicular primary or intraclavicular metastasis would also be a picture. Okay. So uh, uh, Pankaj, I just want to make one comment yes. which may be relevant today in the COVID times. 
what I do is, and I agree with everybody, that there are a lot of studies that show that CT is good enough because the primary site of metastasis is lung. But since we are all head and neck oncologists, when I suspect bone or other distant metastasis, like for a hypopharyngeal or a nasopharyngeal, PET CT is what I go for. But for an oral, it may be CT is adequate. It's common cost effective. But my point I want to make in COVID times, I've changed my practice. So I evaluate for operability with one scan and I do my CCT of chest two days before. So I have my RT-PCR swab plus a CT of the chest. So I've ruled out COVIDs, the CORADs, as well as I've ruled out distant metastasis. Whether it makes sense, I don't know, but to me it seems logical. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. So I would so come here. after the investigation, so we all know this is a patient who has got a supranosh disease. Now we have Dr. Mooney as a chairperson, so I would definitely raise this question. Supranosh disease for many of us is a contraindication for surgery. So Dr. Anand, I would like to ask you, what is actually uh, the, the extent where you would say I would not operate this patient? This is inoperable. Actually, uh, the point is you have raised a very valid point, supranos disease, what people see that it looks inoperable. But I think nowadays, we, even the paper shown by Dr. Pankaj Chaturvedi, they have done a study and they have found that even in, uh, in, uh, in stage 4B diseases, they have operated, but they have not found a good survival. So that is, a, that is like when you operate, it's important like whether the patient will have a good survival or not. That the quality of life is very important. And in this case, I think there's an extension to the fat, which is going in this case. And pterygopalatine posa is involved, I think. Dr. Pankaj, is it involved in yes, this case? Pterygoid, both uh, the pterygoid muscles are involved. So the disease is going high up. If you take a plane, the disease is going in the supranotch uh, space. Yes, so, yes, yes. So, so I would like to bring in here Dr. Shamit. Shamit, uh, Dr. Muni, you know, they, he... And with the, uh, Dr. Trivedi, they divided even the supranosh disease into a low supranosh and a high supranosh disease. So in your practice, do you go for an upfront surgery for a low supranosh disease? So, so there is a, there's an article by, by, I think Dr. Moni was the lead author, but Vijay yeah, Pillai, yeah. Vijay Pillai was one of the, and they, yeah. and they did a very elegant description of classes mm -hmm. of ITF involvement. And we've tried to take a leaf out of that. And class three ITF involvement probably to us is a contraindication to upfront surgery. But in this patient, it appears that we'd be able to get a margin. I think uh, Anand was mentioning T4B disease, which, you know, if you look at or if you extrapolate um, AJCC staging, it's probably a misnomer because everything lateral to the medial pterygoid fascia will be classified as very advanced look, uh, oral cancer. And that might not really be the only indicator or the, or the, or the point at which you want to decide surgical operability. So yes, so we, we subdivide our ITF involvements and, and take a call. This patient looks resectable based on the limited images that Pallavi showed us. Dr. Shamit, I, I, if I get you correctly, so the the T, the, he, the, that Moni's paper divided this into three parts, the class one, the class two, and the class three. The class two and three were the part of the supranosh disease. Yeah. But the class two was a low supranosh. There is always a question, can we get a margin in the supranosh disease? Because that will determine the survival. So in a low supranosh disease, would you like to go for an upfront surgery or would you like to go for a, some new adjuvant to downstage the disease? So for a high supranosh, and again, I'm, I'm taking the lead again from our brilliant Indian authors who have put out this yeah. paper, Dr. De Cruz is amongst us. Uh, the thing that concerned me in the history was that the edema was going up to the level of the zygoma, but it was not going superior to the zygoma. Suprazygomatic extension for sure becomes high supranosh disease and would not be a candidate for surgery upfront, in my opinion. Uh, that patient should get neoadjuvant chemotherapy and based on performance status, either the two or the three drug regimen that Vijay Patel and his colleagues pointed out. But for this patient, a low supranosh disease, and again, you know, a lot of the times this decision making is going to be subjective and it's going to be single institution driven or maybe, maybe our philosophy driven. It just seems to me that negative margins would probably not be an issue in this patient based on what we saw. Uh, we have posterior lateral wall of maxilla involvement, but then the pterygoid plates are not grossly invaded based on the radiology that we saw. The muscles are there. And then again, I, I do not, I'm not a proponent of compartmental dissection per se, but this would probably be a candidate where you can get your lower uh, cheek flap in. You can get the entire so, mantle because you Dr. Have to Dr. Shamid, if I get you correctly, so for all low supranosh disease, you are a proponent or you would recommend surgery. 
anybody in the panel uh, would like to go for a new adjuvant treatment for a low supranoch disease or they are all in favor of surgery in a low supranoch disease so i think the category class 1 is clear the high supranoch is clear so there remains a borderline area of a low supranoch disease maybe you know, nishant should yeah, make yeah. some nishant might want to make some comments yeah, from yeah. chicago because yeah. uh, the the indian authors all believe they can take out all disease <laughs> and shamit was going to operate the last case i nearly <laughs> fell off my chair but after nishant i'll make some comments yeah so i defer to the surgical experts <laughs> you with this much uh, more no no I listen so dr dr nishan we are not being politically correct here huh so dr nishan what do you think what do you think would you like to go in for surgery for this i i have changed my mind over the last 5 years since i've come to chicago where i see tremendous benefit for new adjuvant um induction chemotherapy um it does help our surgical resection i think it helps um with some margin issues and i think it it improves um in our cases outcomes um considerably um but there is no high level evidence to support that okay dr deepak what is your practice so the the entire evidence is based on the two papers that have been published from tata Uh, mm -hmm. one is with 700 patients and the other was a match pair analysis if you look at their actual indications their actual indications were for supranoch disease where they would give uh, new adjuvant induction chemotherapy yeah hey, dr deepak But, i would i would ask a straight question this is a low supranoch would you like to go in for surgery or would you no, be so going for new adjuvant if the base of the pterygoids at the sphenoid has no tumor and it can be resected either with a mandibulotomy approach or with a circumferential skin incision over the maxilla and a patient can be given post operative chemo rt in both the tata papers they have they have insisted Dr. that the deepak I, i high supra notch i think there is no confusion people would go for no not go for a front i am asking for this specifically for this low supra notch yeah. Dr. Shamit is in favor of surgery. Dr. Nishant wants to go for new adjuvant. What do you I, want to go for? I would operate as long as the base of the pterygoid. You also up. want to go for surgery, Dr. I, Salim. In your but part, you you have to. This is a very interesting case. The reason is patient has trismus, so yeah. you've got to find an access to the oral cavity. Yeah. yeah. So you can do a lower lip split, but then you can't do an upper lip split because he's got skin of the cheek involved. So and the skin of the cheek, if you go circumferential, you can expose the maxilla. And I, I'll, 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 I'll come. I'll come to that. Also, Doctor Deepak, I'll, I'll come to that. I'll come yeah, to okay, that. Sorry, sorry. I'll come to that. First, yeah. let's decide whether to go for surgery or to go to surgery. go for new adjuvant. Surgery. Doctor Salim, what do you think? We we here we adopt the for this patient induction chemotherapy, uh, also because there is a massive lymph node involvement, and we know that uh, there was a subgroup analysis in the in the study that was uh, no benefit from this. Uh, So Dr. Salim is a friend of Dr. Nishant. Okay. No, but Dr. Salim, 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 Dr. Sal coma or skin involvement and that is anterior disease it has nothing to do with infra temporal fossa it's disease no, in the soft tissue cheek so yes. that's where we want to give neo adjuvant because it will shrink the tumor and it's only edema it's not disease it's if you will edema yes zygoma so please don't confuse that paper where the major indication was soft tissue disease in the cheek yes. but i think a lot is being made about this infra temporal fossa high and low to me this high and low started by leo's paper which was on 47 cases people Pick picked it number. up and then heroic said we could operate every patient with high and low to me yeah. deepak made the most important point of this whole thing if the base of the pterygoid plates are free and you can get a margin i would operate because That's the base of pterygoid i mean whether, so i want to ask all these guys about high and low where are the pterygoid plates up or down 
tell me are they in the high or in the low infra temporal fossa please answer me Do- that question. dr shamit dr shamit would you answer yeah. this question so sure sure uh, yeah we again it's it's we quake in our boots when sir speaks but we'll try to do our best so if you if you talk about pterygoid plates per se and you know the same thing is being proven yet again because from what i understand and and correct me if i'm wrong and pallavi can correct me uh, but the base of the pterygoid plates are free in this case no no samit you just tell me are the pterygoid plates in the high or the low infra temporal fossa if so you drew are, a line from the sigmoid so there are there are there is the base of the pterygoid plates would probably constitute where low becomes high and yeah, so probably, then that so, is probably where all of us would typically tend to change modality and probably give so, because so, even so, in the tata paper even in the tata paper sir t4 b buccal cancers and again i'm preaching to the choir when i'm saying that but 60% of your 68% of your patients became resectable after giving them either the three drug or the two drug regimen but i'll, I'll want to throw one more thing in the mix there's also an issue about compliance to multimodality treatment last year we presented our data on compliance to initially offered treatment modality uh, in about 420 patients of oral cancer at the academy last year at new orleans and what we found was initial treatment modality compliance was only about 60% again it might differ uh, in different parts of the country 60% to initial and we are really looking at a disease we are looking to downstage and then really offer the definitive therapy namely surgery compliance to recurrent disease or residual disease was even lower so are probably as you would probably agree Uh, we can't really extrapolate from western literature in all aspects yes we can extrapolate in certain aspects but this biology we could but yes our patients have a different population also so we would tend to offer it in low supra notch but i completely agree higher than the pterygoid plates we would typically offer new adjuvant okay. chemotherapy based on your data okay okay dr shamit uh, as we have to go further so suppose if we go by the dr nishant and dr salim's approach and if to go for a new adjuvant chemotherapy i would like to bring in dr pragya here So, what is uh, the your practice of giving new adjuvant, Doctor Pragya, a doublet or a triplet? Now, we all know the triplet has got you know a much better response rate compared to doublet, but it has its own problems in terms of logistics, financial issues, and giving therapy over a period of times and toxicity. Doctor Pragya, so uh, we have um, like uh, we give uh, go for doublet because uh, most of the patients that are who are coming to our institute are not in. um in the condition to uh, bear with the toxicity and uh, the compliance issues associated because of the toxicity they uh, interrupt the treatment so um, it is like no it it is very individualized um, we look at the patient profile but uh, yeah uh, seeing the criteria that we are catering to we go for them so dr pragya if i get you correctly though triplet is better it is difficult to give the triplet yeah. to majority of our patients because of multiple factors but i want to add one thing there two papers from tata said that if you add taxanes to your initial platinum their responses are better than the conventional cis 5fu taxane so if you're considering doublet you have to consider a taxane doublet with i don't know pragya you have to be the better person to answer this is from what you have published i find that cis plat with paclitaxel has the best response uh, if you're not considering triplet if you're considering doublet it should not be cis and 5fu it should be platinum with taxa is that what so you I, i agree with the literature but uh, in our circumstances it is uh, difficult to implement there are so many issues associated uh, so we in um, prefer I, giving cis platinum and 5fu Uh, in most of the cases um because the, you know the uh, people that uh, come to our setup um, the criteria the, the cadre that we are offering and uh, treatment to but yeah i agree uh, that uh, texol based i I, is, I, uh, I, i i got your point dr pragya the other problem the, is even but, with the extreme trial your best overall response with uh, cisplat 5 if you is 20% but if you had a taxane in the tax t uh, t2 dr uh, deepak dr deepak i i got i got your point and i think it's a very important point to be made to attendees that though triplets with the uh, is better but many a times it becomes difficult to replicate what is there in the books to your practice yeah okay so yeah. i'll i'll come to dr anand suppose you have given two cycles of chemotherapy and the tumor responds well when when would you like to operate after how many cycles maybe two cycles or you would like to go two more how many is after how many cycles you would like to operate 
after two at our hospital we take a protocol like after two cycles we evaluate the patient mm -hmm. if the response is good then we take for the surgery if the response is not good then we again go for a third cycle okay as the literature suggests that the maximum tumor shrinkage occurs till fourth cycle and, and there is unlikely any response further to after fourth cycle so you would like to operate after two cycles any yes, difference yes. of opinion dr nishant um i i would see you can assess response and if the patient's responding i would give him a third cycle if the patient is not responding then i would switch to surgery So, dr so, dr rathor sir any any difference of opinion or you would also go after third cycle so oh, actually there is a response hello 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 yes dr rathor sir ha uh, yes uh, in our setup we are following the practice that after two cycles we are deciding about the surgery because our concern is because this oral malignancy is a basically mucosal malignancy it spreads by mucosa so the question which was earlier discussed uh, whether supra notch lower notch higher notch lower notch it was basically earlier we were deciding this issue based on terigo mandibular refe it was a important landmark which still we are clinically practicing so based on that we decide our surgery and if if uh, now we are dealing the case after two cycles then the primary staging we should always take care because depth of invasion as well as margin how much we want to give will always depend on our first clinical assessment this we should not forget because if it is shrinking very less but there may be some anoxic cells in the uh, shrinked area so this we should always take care and we decide the surgery accordingly okay so pankaj may i make a comment uh, dr yeah, pankaj yeah yeah dr shamik yeah yeah i think the number of cycles is also dependent on what regimen you are committed to if you okay. have a regimen like deepak said which incorporated 5 fu and pragya is okay with that regimen then okay. that regimen typically would have a three uh, three weekly course okay. so normally what we do is if we are committed or if our medical oncology colleagues decide to give triplet chemotherapy incorporating 5 fu uh, then in that case we'll anyway see the patient because response assessment after resolution of dysmoplasia and vasogenic edema is going to be most three weeks after the end of the second cycle yeah. so at that time we'll do a scan and reassess and if we think that uh, we are going to proceed we we'll do that otherwise in the same setting we'll offer a third cycle of chemotherapy however the same situation might not be true if you are uh, committed to a doublet regimen like again deepak was mentioning and pragya was mentioning as well where you have a cisplatin and a taxane based regimen because those regimens are typically given on more frequent intervals but shamit okay dr shamit project here even if you have stable response the patient still do well with surgery after that yeah so you don't have to have complete response थेरपी स्टेटस in oral cancer but now if we follow the same we cannot achieve an organ preservation and with the paper coming from the tata only this asco about the mandibular preservation what do you think what should be the extent of resection based on pre chemotherapy status or based on post chemotherapy status so please let me answer you see there are lot of attendees and i see they are 168 if i ask 168 to do a poll now whether they are going to give two cycles or three cycles they won't know what the answer is if they if they are the nishant agarwal fans they'll give three if they find shamit's uh, accent more compelling they'll give two and deepak of course is the lord so they might give i don't know how many so i think we need to summarize and i think i'll go the nishant route not because i didn't like your accent summit but just because we learn from trials and most trials do a response assessment at the end of two cycles and then when that's complete if your patient is responding and you can see from the classical va trial which was the first trial that taught us the neo adjuvant route and change caused a paradigm shift so i think we have to keep that in mind and mind well if the mandible is not involved if it's a tongue case and i get a complete response if the guy is doing too well after the third cycle i may not not even go the surgical route 
And I've had a lot of patients that way. I'm not muddling the waters. Keep that in mind. So what happens? And now I come to your second question. I gave three cycles of chemotherapy. I got a complete response. So I'm turning it over to Shamit and Deepak. What will be your margins and what will you do for this patient with the tongue cancer? Okay. Uh, does Deepak want to take that or should I, should I go first? So anyone, but please okay. keep in mind a short answer, a Absolutely. very brief answer. Absolutely. So, so in response to sir's comment about whether when we do response assessment, sir, we are basing it on exactly the same thing. Two cycles given, time given for chemotherapy induced edema to solve. <laughs> And then eventually we do a scan for staging and then subsequently we proceed accordingly. We, based on our understanding of literature, will go with pre-systemic therapy margins. Uh, if you have a complete response, then of course it's a big problem because then again, you're, you're removing too much tumor. But then in our experience, we've not really got CRs after two cycles of chemotherapy and T4B oral cancer. Uh, there, are, there are instances when you just have that single focus of microinvasive cancer remaining, but we know that tumor does not shrink completely centripetally. It shrinks leaving tumor islands in its wake. So we are, we are a believer in pre-chemotherapy margins. Dr. Deepak? Uh, I would, uh, based on the Tata evidence, I would do on the post-chemo margins. And then I would make sure that the patient receives adjuvant treatment. Because the only way the patient is going to have local regional control. So, Dr. Deepak, you will, Dr. Deepak, Dr. Deepak, we are running short of time. You will go for a post-chemotherapy status. Dr. D. Cruz, sir, would you like to summarize this now? One person so, is pre-chemo, another person is for post-chemo. So, so I would say very clearly, don't just say Tata paper and this paper and that paper. The Chaukar paper that came out, this ASCO, and the Lisa Lissitra shows us that if we give chemotherapy, it shrinks margin and you can do conservative surgery. No one really knows the true answer. If you are going to go by pre-surgical margins, then you are going to clear the infratemporal fossa all the way up to level three. That's at the skull base. So what I want to tell you is that we will take more generous margins than we would normally have done with the uh, with the uh, de novo surgery. The margins need not. So I'm not going to do a total glossectomy if the patient just has a little nidus of tumor on the lateral border. Oh. I'll excise that with generous margins and then give the patient post-operative oh. adjuvant therapy. Oh. So thank you, thank you so much. Dr. Nishant, your just one, one, line, one line answer. Dr. Nishant, your one line answer. Pre-chemotherapy status post If you look at the biology of response, so now looking at a, at a molecular and histologic level, the tumors don't shrink concentrically. And what happens is you have little piecemeals of tumor. So I think as uh, Dr. Neil just mentioned, I think you have to still be very thoughtful in your approach. Um, and I think you have to interpret the data very, very carefully. And I don't think we really know the right answer for this. But um, we look at a subset of patients whose two-year survival is 20%. Okay. And we have to factor in the quality of life in those two years. I think I think this question is, is still we do not have a consensus for that. No, Dr. D. Cruz said we have to go to the second case. Let okay, go I, ahead. Go ahead. Yes. I use so I, I use frozen section. I use frozen section. I would I would rather finish one case and sort it out totally. Yeah, so I think that's it's very very difficult to have consensus with so many experts on the panel, sir, working differently in different clinics, sir. Uh, Dr. Pallavi, can we go to the second case? Uh, let's make sure you have more reconstructive questions this time. Yeah, we, 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 do, we do have. Next, that is why we, I'm going to the next case. Yeah. So I'll start with the next case. This is a 49 years old gentleman who presented to us with the chief complaint of a non-healing ulcer in the lower lip for four to five months of duration. He was a chronic gutka chewer and... Uh, he had reformed recently. So the patient was a known case of type 2 diabetes mellitus and was on an oral hypoglycemic uh, agents. His HbA1c, which was done post his admission into the hospital, was 9.8. So pretty well uncontrolled. So on assessment of disease, uh, during our clinical examination, we found that the patient had an ECOG performance status of 1. He had a good mouth, uh, um, he had a good mouth opening. On local examination, there was a 5 by 7 centimeter ulceroproliferative growth, which was involving the lower lip and the buccal mucosa, which was the prime epicenter of the disease. Extents were as follows. Anteriorly, it was extending onto the mucosal surface of the contralateral canine, 
posteriorly till the last molar medially the floor of mouth was involved laterally the skin overlying the lip and the chin was indurated superiorly the upper gvs was free of disease on clinical examination of the neck there was bilateral level 1 uh, nodes were clinically palpable we did a biopsy from the tumor which showed evidence of moderate, moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma the patient also underwent a contrast enhanced ct scan and the uh, axial cuts are running in the background it showed a heterogeneously enhancing mass which was epicentered in the left buccal mucosa and was extending on to the lower lip there was a definitive evidence of bicortical mandibular erosion bulky lymph nodes were noted at station 1b 2 and 3 on bilateral sides of the neck so we can see the bulky nodes these are the still images showing the involvement of the mandible and the bulk of the disease as well as the nodes in the neck our clinical diagnosis was uh, the patient was staged as t4a n2cm0 carcinoma oral cavity epicentered on the left buccal mucosa thank you so much dr pallavi now this question i last from dr nishant now this is definitely a resectable advanced oral cancer there is no doubt about it but considering the poor poor glycemic control and the need for a major reconstructive procedure dr nishant do you believe that it can be taken as a soft indication for new adjuvant i think this case is less compelling for new adjuvant um, chemotherapy no, i think considering considering the poor glycemic control the hba1c is 9.8 would you like to give a, a a cycle of chemotherapy or two cycle to bite some time for optimization um i, I wouldn't optimization of his diabetes and nutrition i think that's a different issue than tumor control i think his overall health is not great um but for in terms of tumor um control i don't think um i would do new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy in this case so a- anybody in the panel who is for a you know new adjuvant as a soft indication in this patient or everybody would like to go in for surgery uh, uh pankaj please pankaj who told you if you have a sugar of 300 you can give new adjuvant chemotherapy is it the lesser of the two evils sir, sir sir so i'll go to the next case with this so how long are you going to wait before you take up this patient for upfront surgery you you control it maybe you can do an insulin drip you don't have to wait till christmas to control insulin i mean you can control it over 4 5 7 days if you have a good person and go in for surgery uh, to me it's not it to me it's not an issue I never heard of hyperglycemia being a contraindication. To me, it's not an issue. I don't even need a good endocrinologist. I might do the insulin Perfect. control. Perfect. Perfect. We are all surgeons and would like to go for surgery in this patient. Yep. Now, Dr. Salim, my next question is to you. So, as the lesion is crossing the midline, and and normally we go for a uh, you know contralateral neck dissection, a supraomohyde. Any thoughts of doing SLNB on the contralateral side? A central node dissection on the contralateral side. uh just just one comment regarding the new adjuvant treatment uh, just to mention that uh, just one comment regarding the the induction chemotherapy for this patient uh uh-huh. uh uh-huh. no, no no just just to mention that that nowadays we have um, here many clinical trial that we use you know a uh, pd1 inhibitor uh, depending the uh, um cps in this patient and there is a um some patient that respond very very well to to this induction with with pd1 inhibitor so uh, we used to uh, we used to um recruit this type of patient in the clinical trial and to test the new, the new medication uh, that that is you know the immunotherapy and for this patient uh, uh, this patient i think that uh, uh this need a very skilled surgeon to do in such big surgery that in in our two about meeting it's not a, i i am doubt that if if there's any a uh, surgeon that can do uh, this type of surgery so we start despite the um the hypercalcemia we start with the uh, all clinical trial or induction chemotherapy uh, i know that the induction chemotherapy used the uh, um steroids and this can uh, you know it's not uh, very good for the hypercalcemia and w- with the endocrinologist was uh, we use the induction chemotherapy then depend on the response for such patient we we can we can decide if curative intent or palliative intent 
Okay. Okay, Dr. Salim, uh, my question to you was, uh, would you be going for any thoughts of doing sentinel on the contralateral side? No. Avoid uh, selecting the dissection? We use, no, this is a huge surgery. We do, we do a bilateral lymphoid dissection. Uh, in, the, in the other side, we, 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 we do also selective lymphoid dissection. Because there is a literature coming up going for a sentinel node biopsy on the contralateral side. Dr. Nishant, any thoughts about it? Um, you know, we talked about sentinel nodes. I, it, in these big cases, it doesn't really make sense. They're, they're going to have pretty massive resections and they're going to need exposures to vessels for reconstruction. Um, I would see absolutely no reason to do a sentinel node. In because the European patient. Association for Nuclear Medicine is, uh, you know, one of the recommendations is to go for a sentinel node biopsy for a contralateral like in these advanced cancers. So I hope nobody in 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 our in my panel is willing for a sentinel node biopsy in this. I will not ask this question from Dr. D. Cruz, sir, because I know the answer. No, no, no. But why are you listening to nuclear physicians to decide whether you sir, should operate sir, the next? Sir, sir, attendees, attendees read all, all all the things. So that is why I wanted to bring this question up. Just and a small point. Just a just a small point, Pankaj. In this patient, yeah. it does not apply because I think it was presented as a case of N2C disease. So just for the trainees out there, in positive next, <coughs> yeah. so no if doubt. it is N plus, I think there is no doubt. Now, yeah. and I'll come to Dr. Deepak. He was waiting for reconstruction question. So after the surgery is done, how would you like to reconstruct this defect, Dr. Deepak? So this is a very complex defect in the terms that... Uh, that is why I have asked this question to you. Different uh, components. So we've got to look at the lower lip. We've got uh -huh. to look at the mucosal lining. Uh -huh. got, and in your uh, PPT, you mentioned that the skin is indurated also, uh -huh. meaning that the labiomental skin is involved and you uh -huh. might excise uh -huh. the labiomental skin. Uh -huh. So if you look at it, if you want to reconstruct the bone and the intraoral mucosa, let me, very, let me be very specific. It's the bone and the intraoral mucosa. The bone is absolute mandatory because it's crossing the midline. He would have an anti gum deformity and he has a floral mouth defect. We have to tether the tongue to the uh, fibular free flap so that it doesn't fall back. So we need a fibular flap for the bone and the intraoral mucosal defect. Now, the lip has to be thought of differently. Please don't have it in your mind that you can use a wide fibular skin paddle to reconstruct the ventral tongue, the floor of mouth, and the lip because there'll be complete effacement of the vestibule and the patient will have gross oral incompetence. That is not at all acceptable, especially in a patient who's got necrotic lymph nodes and gross ECS whose life expectancy is low. You <coughs> have to make sure that their life, quality of life is good and they have oral competency. So Dr. Deepak, how are you going to reconstruct it? So my entire aim is to reconstruct the vertical height of the lower lip that can be done uh -huh. with the DB flap, a supraclavicular flap or, or a radial forearm flap with the tensor fascia lata sling. Uh -huh. Because the upper lip is static, the lower lip is what is dynamic. It moves with the, the mandible. Uh -huh. So unless you're willing to do two, free, uh, two flaps, it can be one free flap, one uh, 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 pedicle flap, or it can be two free flaps. Unless you're willing to do so this Dr. sort Deepak, of what would be your plan? Dr. Deepak, what would I be your plan? I would do a fibula and a radial forearm without any question. And I have done it also for countless patients. So because so here the labial mental skin is important. You said okay. that the skin was indurated, meaning the divot between the lip and the mentum is involved, exactly where the mentalis is attaching with the mandible. Okay. If you don't close that area with vascularized skin, your plate will expose and the patient cannot receive post-operative radiation. Forget all the non-reconstructive surgeon's opinion. It just doesn't happen because I've seen over the last 10 years, you need to have vascular cover, not for the oral cavity, but also for the hardware oh. that you place to hold the mandible together. Okay, okay. So I would do two uh, flaps. Dr. Anand? Okay. So two flaps. Dr. Anand, any any other thoughts? No, no, I agree with Deepak completely agree because it needs at least two flaps and we have to see subsides actually. So I it's have a clear. question for you now. So you know in yes. current COVID pandemic, would you change your plan? Yeah, in current COVID pandemic and we can any, take any, like any a, role of pedicle flap? Yeah, yeah, we can take PMMC flap. 
we can take pmmc flap with rib also we can take because we need to give a uh, the anterior part of the bone will be gone we can take pmmc with rib no we the pmmc take... with the rib is the most useless flap that you can take because post radiation the rib will come avascular i have had enough experience to say that if you want to look at the patient with good vascularity post op there are enough publications to say that you focus on the bone and the intraoral reconstruction the most that is what is important because that is no. what separates the oral cavity from the neck so what will be your choice in pedicle flap for this patient needs hey. a irrespective of whatever you if, if he is not ready Doctor, for free flap ankaj i want to make a point deepak yeah, doctor is so, so confidently well. about his personal views and he's categorical that this is bullshit and this is good and you have to do it and 10 years experience but for the neck he wanted big randomized trials to be validated in community I do you think we need to have some lack one minute one minute, yeah. one minute do we need to have any criteria by which we can know whether it's one flap two flaps whether you have to put a tensor fascia lata or a palmaris longus what will you do have you got quality of life studies comparing one against the other just for my knowledge yeah so there is quality of life looking at lip reconstruction and they have shown that if you look at lip reconstruction as a separate subunit and if you increase the oral competence patients have a better quality of life in oral intake i am not talking about speech i am not talking about dento alveolar uh, articulation i'm not talking about anything else in this patient so if we put a dp you will get oral one minute if you, you put dp you will get no, oral competence you will not you have to Then, raise the height of the dp and make it uh, in competence with the commissure whatever reconstruction you do the deltopectoral that's the pro- point supraclavicular you okay. have to maintain the vertical height okay. of the lower okay, lip okay dr deepak okay dr deepak i think I, i'll bring in dr shamit dr shamit so so you know uh, besides what has already been discussed uh, if you if you look at the aims of the reconstruction of the lower third of the face which is what we're talking about here and it's a full thickness defect i did not see any any pode or orange appearance of the chin Uh, the patient looked like he was uh, uh, he had all facial hair but i'll take your word for the fact that this won't be meant to alveolar uh, involvement because that's the case that we are discussing here if you look at competence which is the essential issue if you and if you look at the other aims structural support of the lower third of the face and if you look at facial contour it's obvious that aims number 2 and 3 will be best fulfilled as we have all agreed whether with, with an osteocutaneous or a free flap uh, incorporating bone uh the fibula since all of us have more experience in that probably emerges as a natural choice and like deepak said i would use it for central segment reconstruction uh probably use something to augment the submentum so maybe use a little bit of a cuff of flexiolosis and and uh, uh, and, and also tibialis uh, and, uh, will, and the skin will, will yeah let me let me finish dr deepak yeah, dr let just let him complete let, yeah let me finish and the intraoral skin uh, and the soft tissue will be will be used for the intraoral reconstruction uh agreed that two flaps have to be used but if you have to go ahead with using a dp i would i would advise probably reading ralph kilbert's paper and we we probably based our practice a little bit on that agreeing with dr de cruz that reconstruction barely has as much literature as survival data or survival outcomes but there is a pro- relatively constant proximal peroneal perforator of the fibula which can be used for a double paddle work in this age of covid again like i don't believe in it because we've never ascribed to it i think all of us have now moved on to doing routine microvascular reconstruction but yes i am slightly concerned about the fact that the patient is an uncontrolled diabetic blood viscosity makes a difference and two free flaps probably would uh, again the amrita group has done a bit but i would be queasy about doing it i would first isolate the proximal peroneal perforator use it as a skin flap only for the external and somehow try to raise the height maybe use a little bit of a sling in that area uh, like we talked about but that skin is probably going to serve the same purpose as a dp yes if you use a radial then you get a, a functionally better outcome with regard to competence okay dr shamit thank you so much but my next question to you only so there was an you know cas uh, coming into the mandibular reconstruction and there was a concern about the predetermined margins can affect the actual margins so what are your thoughts about it i uh, know i'm sorry just uh, could you just rephrase the question for me one second the predetermined margins based on cas can can yes. they affect the actual margins there there has been a concern yeah so normally we we just do what uh, what we would typically do in any case like this this is based on not just standard teaching it hasn't really changed in our practice for a long time uh, 
we we uh, usually again in this patient it looked like there was no involvement of the lower mandible uh, mm-hmm. the lower mandibular contour seemed intact uh, so the scenario would be two different ways if i had a lower mandibular contour that was preserved I, it would be better for me to pre contour the ex- the plate that i'm planning okay. to use okay and then and then of course after pre contouring i would get my two screws in on each side so that i have four point fixation following which i would look at the soft tissue extent of the tumor not just the bony extent on radiology and go a centimeter beyond now if i am concerned about chin being numb then i would have already done a ct and an mri of the patient mm-hmm. so that i can mm-hmm. pick up peridural mm-hmm. extension retrograde in that case the bony margins will also be determined by that and as professor rathor pointed out frozen section is important in that regard cas has not really changed our practice but yes okay. the important point for the trainees would be don't just look at margins mm-hmm. beyond the bony resection factor mm-hmm. in bone as well as soft tissue margins in our decision making about where you have to take the mandible approach thank you so much shamit and aditi is messaging me again and again reminding that the time is over mm-hmm. one question one point this is total at our one one point we are using a different type of labs here but remember that uh, we have to give repost of radiotherapy also so yeah. that will again affect the outcome of each and every flap so pre contouring and using flap this and we want a good quality of life also so i think these factor we should carefully assess and depending on the situation whether it patient is cachectic or ne- negative notary to balance is there so we decide the case accordingly this this is thank, my point thank yeah. thank you so much dr rathor it was really my privilege having you all on this panel i'll hand over to dr uh, moni for his expert comments and if there are any questions in the q and a uh, box from the attendees he may ask and over to uh, it's over to dr moni thank you so much sorry if thank i interrupted i really appreciate sir sorry. very very excited excitable panel you have uh, you managed to control all of them this one question <laughs> to dr pragya uh, this is from dr shilpi sharma uh, the question is uh, the response rate of uh, cisplatin plus 5 fu and uh, when will you uh, advise the patient uh, surgery question to pragya yeah um, so uh, shilpi is a dear friend uh, from tmh and my roommate from tmh so uh, this is pattern and five of you uh, we have seen good response yeah we have not conducted any study wherein we have compared head and uh, head on with the uh, dexol based chemotherapy and it is usually after uh, two cycles that we go for response evaluation and uh, mostly as uh, i think shamit uh, commented uh, like when the edema subsides and then it is uh, totally the surgeon's call as to when and how they want to go about it thank you dr pragya and now i'll hand over the the uh, mic to dr vipin for concluding remarks dr vipin over to you yeah uh, thank you so much sir uh, and uh, we had a wonderful oral cancer session today and uh, thanks pankaj for bringing in lot of fire to it and bringing in lot of controversy to it uh, so that is the essence of uh, any panel discussion before i actually begin i wish to congratulate professor de cruz again on behalf of the organizers uh, for being the first elected president of uicc am i correct sir <laughs> so this is the first time we have gone online uh, for our annual head and neck conference and uh, uh, once registration started pouring in uh, we were very quick to realize the importance of an online medium and uh, we could see a tenfold jump in the number of registrations we had than what we actually had during a physical conference and i am even quicker to realize that there is significant attrition in the number of registrations and the actual participation and there is a significant drop in that but nevertheless uh, this medium is very beneficial for the organizers in terms of uh, decreased cost and uh, for the guest faculty and for the delegates uh, they are able to sit in the safety of their uh, home or office and they are able to participate and uh, there is a penetration of knowledge uh, and sharing of ideas across the globe and we had uh, participation from across the globe uh, from new zealand to 
uh, Indian subcontinent to Middle East uh, and North and South America. And uh, after this uh, a symposium, I am wiser, at least my geographical knowledge has improved. So I am now able to differentiate between Baltic countries and uh, Balkan countries, which I was unable to understand earlier. So uh, I'm, uh, for the organization, I'm very thankful to the uh, UChicago team, uh, both in India as well as United States. Uh, it is Aditi's uh, legendary uh, leadership, uh, which is uh, always there uh, with us for the last five years. And uh, uh, Suman, Vikram, and Arvind, uh, they worked tirelessly uh, for all our conferences. And in the United States, uh, Nandini and Rifat have been wonderful. They have been uh, excellent in their job. And uh, my particular thanks to Professor Alok Thakkar, uh, President of FHNO and uh, a Scientific Director for this uh, conference for giving all his support in designing the uh, scientific program and uh, uh, executing it. And if I say thanks, Nishant, it would be an understatement. Five years back, we started with Nishant as the only guest faculty with few delegates from UCMS and MAMC. And uh, I'm still embarrassed that we could not pay for his travel during his first uh, trip. <laughs> I still feel bad about it. Uh, and, no, uh, not at all. <laughs> And uh, uh, I'm very thankful to Nishant, and I wish we can continue this uh, collaboration in future also. So thanks, Nishant. And uh, I thank the entire guest faculty who took out their time and uh, uh, joined us uh, today. And uh, there is something to be learned from everybody every day. And uh, I thank all the attendees, and uh, I thank all my entire team in UCMS. Uh, who work uh, uh, very hard uh, to bring in this content online. And uh, this was actually the first session and we have three more to go. And uh, I wish uh, uh, that uh, everybody participates in the same enthusiasm as we had in the first session. And uh, I thank you very much and you all have a great day. Lippin, you thank everyone else but your, yourself. So the key to the success <laughs> of this is Vipin. Um, so Vipin, you, you are very understated, but all, all the credit goes to you. So thank you very much for making the 